Welcome to IBMF Business Plan Lab. This is Section 3, Market Research and Analysis. This section addresses the company's market and includes an in-depth analysis of the market. The section is also known to be one of the most difficult to prepare, yet it is arguably the most important one. Other sections of the business plan depend on the market research analysis that will be presented here because of the importance of market analysis and the critical dependence of other parts of the plan on the information you advise to prepare the section of the business plan with great attention to detail take enough time to do the section thoroughly and to check alternative sources of market data the section should convince the reader of or the investors or potential partners that you truly know your customer it should convince the reader that you, your product or service first will have a substantial market in the growing industry and second can achieve sales in the face of the competition that exists already. For example, the predicted sales levels will dif directly influence factors such as the size of the manufacturing operation, the marketing plan, the amount of the debt and equity capital the business will require. Uh, unfortunately, most entrepreneurs seem to have great difficulty preparing and presenting market research and analysis to show that the Venture, venture sales estimates are sound and attainable. Uh, today, we will talk about some effective tools that will help you in conducting relevant market research. So before we even start talking about the tools, let's address the question, why market research? There is often um, a lot of resistance to doing market research. Indeed, there is frequent criticism of writing a business plan in general. The point of the slide is to talk more about the specific benefits of what you'll learn by doing your market research. People might think of the market research as something that big companies do, and that is true in the formal sense, big companies carry out grandiose market research campaigns. However, what we are talking about in this session is more to focus on what the entrepreneur can and should do as part of their overall feasibility analysis. So remember that some of you are still at the early stages of your company, Perhaps you haven't even founded a company. You might want to know that as the company grows larger, the nature of the research to be done will change. Also, a lot of business plan is just information. The research is what makes this different and makes it stand out. So while the plan is important, the fundamental ground that this plan stands on is it's this research that we have to do for the market and the industry. Uh, poor research, if you put it in, it will pr produce high uncertainty, with high uncertainty it will produce a poor plan and the likelihood of having things to go according to a plan. So market research um, lets you to get know more about your customers, their wants, their behaviors and their ability to pay. Uh, provides you with a chance to update and improve what you already do, allows you to have first contact with the customer so they get to hear about you, provides you with more confidence and believability with the other stakeholders, as I mentioned, uh, investors, partners, uh, suppliers, and so on. And also helps you reduce the overall risk in your business. And it's really the true value of the business plan. Many entrepreneurs think just because they have a DBA or LLC, they are in business. They're not really in business until they have customers, until they have a transaction. So it's all about the customers. Customers create market-driven opportunities. It doesn't matter what anyone thinks about your concept except the customers. If they don't care, no one will buy your product. Good quality market research includes gathering information from your customers, potential customers, people who, will, who are willing and able to buy your products. Customers can also help you refine and perfect your business concept and your business model and we'll go more in depth and more examples of that. And here's a short video by Katie Roden, who was um, co-founder of Proactive Solution. Uh, this example helps you illustrate the benefits of learning more about customer via market research. We had never really heard of what market research is. Now when we're thinking, why do we have to do market research? We tested it on our patients. Well, as they sort of told us, your patients love you. <laughs> they want to please you. They want to tell you everything is great. They're not going to tell you that they would never use this stuff. Um, and you need to find some outside sources to validate this whole concept. So we hired the friend who was a market researcher, and we were going to do a professional focus group. So we get these 30 women divided into groups of 10. The market researcher is there, and 
my partner and I are on the other side of a, one of those one-way windows, and we're looking out. We're eating M&Ms nervously, and while well, she's asking him questions, and two really key things came out of that. One is, which was amazing, I never would have guessed, that all these women believed that they really, they weren't really sure they didn't have acne. You know, how can the couple of bumps that they get every month be acne? When the teenager with the oily skin and all the breakouts, that's acne. So they really couldn't comprehend the, that they had this problem. So that was number one. The other, uh, and the, uh, still part, part two of one, <laughs> is that a lot of women thought that, you know, they, they didn't want to talk about having acne. Acne was an ugly problem. And they didn't want to identify with it in a group of other people. So that was sort of an embarrassment. So we had that situation, which we knew was going to present a big challenge to us <laughs> later on. The other thing that we saw, we didn't hear it, but we saw it, we passed our products around the room. And they put it on their skin, and they put it up to their nose, and they just, ugh, they went like this. And when the researcher asked him, you know, would you be willing to put this product all over your face on a daily basis to treat this problem that you don't really even think you have? <laughs> what do you think the answer was? Uh, it was no. And so Kathy and I looked at each other and we went, uh, it's back to the drawing board. So here we are, as many entrepreneurs face, you know, we're like rats in a maze. You know, we come up against a roadblock. Okay, now what? Okay, we got to start over. We have to start over. We can't launch a product that's giving us this kind of a response. And it was different from what our patients had been telling us. So we spent another year reformulating our products. Finally, we get to a place where, yes, we think that they're good, okay? So in this example, Proactive, essentially an anti-acne acne cream, that is best known for its infomercial infomercials shows that they learned a lot more about how to position the company based on the market research for a particular customer segment, namely the women. The previous market knowledge was essentially from patients, people who were generally biased towards the company. The goal of research is not to hear more about what you already know and just to look confirm it, but rather to learn something new or different about the customer. Before we go into the market research, I just want to make some quick distinctions. There's often a confusion between the industry and the market. What is the market? When we talk about market, really we're really talking about the customers. Customers are the ones that give you the money. Customers are the ones that exchange your money for services or products. Maybe different than those that end up using your product, otherwise also called end users. So for example, if I'm a Facebook website, my customers are businesses as well as private individuals. The private individuals are really the users of Facebook. However, the advertising that I generate my income is really on my customers. So there is a difference between end users and customers. Customers are the ones who pay you the exchange for your service or your product. And also another example would be Toyota automotive dealers are uh, Toyota's customers, but people buying the cars are the end users. And the industry, we covered the industry in the last section. Those are the other sellers, which includes your competitors, suppliers, vendors, and other support sales companies, which can include distribution, packaging, and so on. So our focus are the customers. Some of the most vital things you should learn about your customers and from your customers when you talk to them and do the market research is really you want, you want to understand who they are. You want to segment your market to find out really who are the people that are most likely willing and able to buy your pro products or services and come back and buy more. How many of them are there? So you want to find out what your market size is. Uh, how do they buy? You want to understand what their buyer behavior is. How do they act from a point that they never heard about you to a point that they're going to come back and, and buy more and more products or services from you. And can they buy it? Customer economics. And what they love about your product, your product services, your concept, effectiveness of, of the idea. So we'll cover these five today in addition to some tools that will help you learn more about your customers which will prepare you great with great foundation for the rest of your business plan. So the first vital sign uh, that you want to understand is really the market segmentation. 
And in market segmentation, you're going to be identifying distinct buying groups and developing marketing strategies to fit each group. Effective and efficient segmentation strategies produce significant differences in return on investment of capital. A lot of times, entrepreneurs say, when you ask them, who are you selling to and who's buying your products, they say everybody. Well, I typically then answer, well, I'm not your customer because I'm not buying your products or services or what you just told me is not true. And this is because a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, do not know really who are the persons, individuals that buy the products and services. When I had my own business, I was in construction business, I did bathroom remodelings. I knew that my customers were, for example, when it comes to bath and kitchen remodeling, tend to be predominantly females, women, age 55 and above, who had uh, disposable income and who were looking to re replace and improve the kitchens and bathrooms every five to seven years. So that was my market segment, target market segment. But we'll go more in details about it later on. For now, let's talk about the tools to identify a target market. When you want to identify a target market, when you want to break it down, you want to ask yourself, who will buy my products and services? Who will buy it at the beginning stage and later stages? Are there other, other customer groups that might be buying it? What are my custom demographics? Uh, where are they geographically located? Uh, what are their buyer behaviors? What are some perceived benefits? How does the venture meet their needs? What, is it, what are user ra usage rates and custom psychographics? So we will go now in more details about each one of these tools to help you better understand how to derive your, mark, your, your, your market segments, how to segment your market and identify who, is your core, who are your core customers. So let's start with the custom and demographics. Here you're really looking at core dem characteristics such as the age of your customers, gender, ethnicity and race. And then also you want to look at social characteristics such as the income level, education, ed occupation, life cycle of the single married family empty nesters alternative so these are the customer demographics and uh, when we talk about geography and location you can break it down by zip code you can break it down by region you can break it down by state or area in the nation you can also identify as are my customers in a more urban or rural developed rural area and even if you're urban is it large medium small if it's suburban where is it going to be located, and then convenience, travel to locations, types of transportation, is it easy to access it, what are some weather issues, and then what is the rad radius of your market. So if I have a coffee shop, really, what, what would be my zip code that that's, has the best clientele that would use my high-end coffee shop, let's say. And then would I have to go, where would I have to go? Of course, I have to go somewhere where there's more dense and urban development, it could be an ur urban area. Uh, it can be a large, medium, or small. I would not go to rural because really it's a high end, so I don't know how many uh, customers are there. Is the convenience? I want to be in the convenient location, maybe a mile that people can walk five to ten to fifteen minutes away from my store. So this is just an example how you can use the how you can use geography and location. And this is for the customers. This is for individuals. You can also do business segmentation if you are business to business business. So if you're selling to other businesses, you can break it down by kinds of businesses you're going to be catering to. Is it manufacturers, service providers, is it retailers, wholesalers? And then also remember the next categories we talked last uh, last session in the industry analysis. Also, you can break it down and, and identify them by position on the business life cycle. Are they just a startup? Are they a declining business? Uh, buying motivations of that business location, the structure, is it a corporation, LLC, partnership, sole proprietorship, what are the sales levels, you can do go by number of employees, and also on the distribution patterns. So these are all different variables that you can use in segmenting your your your, your, your customers, the market you're going to be dealing with. Uh, another important uh, aspect of, of, of variable you want to understand is the customer buyer behavior. What do they buy? Why do they buy it? What are some of the key motivators for them to buy it? Who buys? How do they buy? The length and the nature of the buying process. Uh, how much do they buy? Estimated demand. Um, when do they buy it? How often do they buy it? Are there some patterns and buying habits? And where do they buy? So these are some of the key questions you have to answer uh, when you look at your, your customers. And when you want to... And, and, and these... The, the, 
buyer behavior will help you later on develop a great marketing plan to understand who buys, when they buy, how they buy it. That way you can develop all great marketing tools to attract these customers and, and, and maintain them as a customers and have them as a repeat customers. Another variable you can use is perceived benefit. And when I say another variable, it doesn't mean you should only use one. You can use all of them together. Should, and the best is really the more you know, the better it is. If you use both psychographics, demographics, if you use perceived benefits, user rage, use, usage rate, and then everything else that we talked about, it will help you better understand who your customer is and better segment it. So in terms of perceived value, you want to ask, what is each segment getting out of the product? Is it the convenience, the status they're getting? Security, safety, sociability, self indulgence Is this, are they just getting this uh, for the entertainment? Is it a romance that they're getting out of it? Is it comfort, durability, or any other perceived benefits? So you want to ask yourself what would be potential benefits and then also see what are, who are the customers that are buying from competition. That's always a good start to see what they're perceiving as a benefit by your competitor. And then you can see how do you create value and how it will match your value creation in your business. I mentioned usage rate previously. Um, is there any variability within different segment? How often do we use certain things, products and services? Uh, variability across segments. Uh, is the pattern of usage? An example is that 80%, 80-20% rule, meaning that 80% of, of, of all your users or 80% of the usage of your product comes from 20% of your customers. So if 80% of usage of your product or service comes from 20% of your customers, then who are those customers? Because these are your target customers. These are your key customers. So you really, there is no rule here what a segmentation has to look like. It is more a, a tool for you and you can be creative in, in developing what best what works best for you. We mentioned about customer demographics. These are really the variables you can get from uh, census data, you know, the age, the sex, uh, income level. But customer psychographics, this is more of a behavioral variables, like lifestyle, some values and attitudes of individuals. Uh, and examples of this would be an outgoing person or introverted person. Is it a family oriented? Is it traditional versus alternative, athletic, party loving, scholarly, and so on. So really, the psychographics is more a behavior based variable that we use. There are also some common types of market segmentations people use sometimes mostly by demographics or by geographic area, by benefits sold by for, for the customers, by what customers want or need, and then also bundling all of these together as I mentioned. So it's really up to you, you how much creative you want to be and um, what, what do you think works best for your company to really understand who your customers are. Uh, in terms of effective market segmentations, you can uh, segment by benefit thought, what customers want, why they buy this product, and uh, you can identify what, what's really the primary versus secondary demand. Primary demand is really the demand that people know about your product or services and they're using your products and services or would be willing and able to buy your products and services. Versus secondary demand is population that does not know about your products and services However, if they knew about your products and services, they would be willing and able to buy your products. So it's primary versus secondary demand to really see if there's only a few people who know about your product and you have a great opportunity selling to them, then how big is the secondary demand? How big is the, the market size of people that don't know about your product, but if they knew, they would buy it. So it's really important for you to know. It, it helps you then strategically position yourself and also helps you with, with marketing later on. Also, you can segment by time of use that customers use the product or services. How often? So when, when, and by purchase timing, when customers buy product services. So you can break it down. If I'm a government contractor, and uh, there is, uh, I have to know when the, go the government entities that I'm tar targeting are buy buying the the product, but also have to know when they're using it. So you can break it down in that as well. Also very important to note that um, effective market segments are sizable and you can identify the size, how big they are, you can identify them, they're identifiable, they're reachable, they're accessible, they respond differently than other segments, they're coherent, but 
are they stable? It varies depending on which industry you are and what you do. And again, depends also what the competition is going to do once you enter the market or you have already entered that market. The target customer profile, uh, when you develop the target customer profile, ask questions of who are the potential customers and why. Um, because once you, you don't want to do a market research now and, and just do talk to everybody, right? You want to really think about this thoroughly and think about who are the potential customers and why would they buy your products? What are they like as consumers or business people? How did they decide to buy or not to buy? What else do they own? Extrapolation, importance of various product attributes, what outside influences affect buying decisions, and then what does this have to in terms of implications for your opportunity and concept? Does this really um, do you really address the need of these customers or your potential customers? And here's an example of a market segmentation chart that one of the students had done in the past. Here's an example of market segmentation of a uh, dog daycare and dog store, I believe. And um, you see how they have on top, they have four potential markets, prudent parents, pet planners, puppy pampers, part-timers. And on the left side, you can see how they, what they use as variables when they did segmentation of the market. So one of their variables is primary benefit sought, need motivators, personal characteristics, age, selling proposition, service product purchase, then usage occasion, frequency of use, then percentage of revenue, estimate percentage of revenue, number of dogs owned, number of pet owners, and media habitats. So they this group looked at the uh, pet owners and then they broke broke them down based on the primary benefits and motivators. So all these variables. So if, just an example, primary benefits sought, the prudent parents are looking for convenience, peace of mind, the pet planner is looking for care and absence in ex exercise, uh, puppy pampers uh, for socialization and companionship, and part-timers really this varies. So you see how um, they were able to identify and break down dog owners based on the primary benefits sought for the dogs. And then you can see actually usage occasion, the, the prudent parent you know, would use this um, during work and travel, the pet planner is really out of town, when they're out of town, puppy pampers would use it irregularly, and the part-timers would, would use it throughout the year. And, and the neat thing is also you can see here who really are um, the, the, where's the majority of the revenue coming from? And you can see the pet planners, the uh, part-timers really produce 30% of revenue, then it's prudent parent, and then puppy pampers are really 15%. And then you can see also how many dogs they have, uh, and then really what's the number of dog owners that these in individuals represent. So even though, for example, the, um, the pet planners present only 37% of the dog owners, they will represent 30% of the business versus pu uh, puppy pampers they present only 10% of, of the dog owner population however they will be 15% of the revenue and so these are just some examples and you can be creative as, as, as much as you want um, this is an example of how you can bundle different variables that we talked about and create a strong market segmentation uh, this is an old market segmentation, but I love it because it kind of breaks it down and gives you a great example of the bundling and then also how you can break uh, a dog owner industry. And I know I'm sure a lot of you have dogs or know people who have dogs and uh, and, and believe me, there's much more to the dog owner than, than this, but these are just key for market segments of this um, dog grooming and, and, and dog, dog care sitting business had in mind and want to pursue. So they left some of them with the reason because there was not profit there and then didn't fit in, within the value that, that they were creating themselves. So once you have identified your market and you have done your market segmentation, you have to calculate the, the size of your market. And you have to choose key segmentation elements that are relevant to business and that are measurable. And also you have to identify what is the potential, total potential of your market size where you have to identify the number of potential customers in that segment, considering who are the, who are the, considering the primary and secondary demand segments as well, 
a reminder primary demand is the folks who are willing and able to buy your products and they know about your products and the secondary demand segments would be people who are not aware about your product but if they were they would purchase your product and then to calculate the market size um, the formula is really you estimate the market size you look at the, the market size you have identified times the percentage of market you tend to capture now don't say you're going to own 100 percent it's impossible don't say you're going to own 50 percent uh, you know be realistic if, you, if, if you're looking at the whole market in the united states let's say i'm trying to sell um, cell phones and i'm trying to enter it if there is if it's multi-billion dollar market i have to be realistic in terms of really do i own one percent zero point five percent whatever it is so be realistic uh, with your market research as with, as with everything else that you do in your business plan then you want to figure out what's your estimate market value uh, once you know your buying behavior which is based on similar existing products or units per customer per year you want to benchmark price per unit and then the value will be really you estimate the market that we just figure out which is market size times percentage of the market intent to capture times units per year times price so that would be your estimated market value and you need that you need the market size in order to figure out your market value i hope i was not confusing in this but why do we do why do we figure out the market size the market size helps to show if there there might be enough demand to help your business cover its costs and potential grow it also may help you in your market segmentation uh, if it shows you how many customers have the problem that you're trying to solve it can help you also figure out how many of them might genuinely be interested in your products or services. Uh, it also shows you the demand and it doesn't change over time. Uh, you figure, you'll find out is the need growing or decreasing and when will the, the start to plateau. Uh, can you, you also have to ask the questions when you look at the market size. Can the customers you've targeted actually buy what you're selling? And why might some people be interested whereas others are not? So here are some examples of uh, when we talk about the market size and doing market research. Um, these three companies are a part of growing trends. The Bulls responds to a growing trend in eating gluten-free. Chevy Vault, the trend in moving co cars to renewable energy sources. And Groupon mixes the trends of social networking and couponing. They save money via online coupons. When examining the segments of people who might want to purchase any of these, there are all kinds of different ch challenges that appear. With the bulls, it is a matter of finding people who are gluten intolerant. This might seem like an easy enough thing to find, but uh, many people who are gluten intolerant don't know it. Uh, Walt, on the other hand, uh, means more than people who just want non-gas non gasoline cars. And the Groupon builds upon a different need for both customers companies who are willing to give up part of the revenue in exchange for promotion via Groupon and the end users which are regular customers looking for bargain. So as I mentioned the the balls right they have difficulty finding people who are gluten intolerant and, and the issue is that a lot of folks don't even know they're gluten intolerant. Um, the folks they might know are the ones who have celiac so it's good to f start doing that but then how about folks who don't know it and the uh, uh, besides the gluten tolerant ones, um, I know that gluten free or gluten has some side effects in, in health. So there might be some additional customers that have to look or approach that are more health conscious and, and who want to avoid wheat products. So that's how you can look at, okay, I have a problem I can solve, health benefit problem, but also have a health benefit to overcome some of the challenges and issues that people feel through the values and attitudes toward the wheat products. Walt, on the other hand, uh, who is targeting people who want to have green cars, you know, they are going to have difficulty because um, we don't really know how many people are willing and able to switch to new cars and what are some of the variables they're looking at. So they have to look at other things besides just having a green car. It might be that they have to target people who are looking for luxury. It might be that they want to look at people who are uh, proud to own drive American cars. So all these things can uh, can play a role in finding the right numbers. And as the time progresses, you also have to kind of change these things because there will be new trends. And how do you trace? How do you stay in, in trends over the time? 
So for you, maybe the best will be really just to do uh, a approximately five year when you do a business plan, we do it what's happening with the next five years, something like that. And that's why a lot of times you'll hear people say, or business providers, entrepreneurs say, you know, revisit your business plan. It doesn't mean redo the entire business plan, but really revisit your sales, revisit who your customers are, and use that to improve your operations, improve your financials, improve your management, and everything else that kind of goes along with that. A lot of the things that you already have in business plan, you don't have to change. But as, as things change uh, in terms of trends and your markets, you know you want to adjust to that and make some tweaks to your business plan. I'm, I mentioned previously buyer behavior. It's really important I ask, and I provided all those questions that you have to ask when you do your buyer behavior. But again, because it helps to understand the ways in which people will buy the product or services. But it's actually more tricky than it may seem. Uh, you have you want to ask questions how and where do customers buy similar products and services so this is where you start really looking at the buyer behavior uh, you don't know who your customers are but you can look at your competition either indirect competition direct competition see who the customers and and, and how they buy where do they buy uh, what steps do they take in buying those products who actually does the buying there and uh, is really the person buying it is that person really or necessary the buying the, the decision maker uh, do they know that they need such product or service if they don't know then how, how you change the behavior or what will take you to change the behavior and if they know then how will you change the behavior in terms of switching from there from somebody else's product to your product there are the thorough examples that you might want to put in here that get a different aspect of this uh, so to take, for instance, the medical device industry that generally targets doctors as influencers in the purchase process, that having doctors suggest a product is likely to affect the patient's likelihood of taking certain medicines. A lot of times you'll see when you go to doctors, you know, they suggest take this medicine or they give you some medicine for free to test it. Again, this is how how we have, how the doctors are being used as influencers and this is also how you can use this as, as, as an example to see to test the buyer behavior and how people shop. Uh, for these three examples we have here, there are distinct different buyer behaviors involved. For the CMY bounty, it is people buying fresh and local grown fruit, veggies, and other products online, and then getting it delivered to the door. The tra traditional way of getting these are either going to the grocery store, which takes a while, uh, potentially more expensive, especially if, if it's locally grown, uh, but you get to feel the quality of the product when you pick it. Or people go to the local farmer's market or market, uh, they have to fight the crowds, it's less expensive, more time consuming and have to leave home after a while. So understanding these steps that, that people will take here with CMY Bounty is fundamental for really getting at knowing whether people are willing to do things differently or not. Another example, uh, LogWorks, it's all about matching people who make logos, graphic designers and buyers. Uh, and this, these are the logos, not the the, the toy logo, lo, lo, logo stones. Uh, so, the logo for a company or business. So, traditional ways of getting a logo involve doing it yourself, which was, which typically appears less professional, or you would have to hire an ad firm, which typically tends to be very expensive. Uh, with logo works, logo works, you can get lower cost multiple options and also provide input into the process. So they understand the buyer behavior, how people buy, and they're providing an alternative to the buyer behavior, to, to, to those buyers that are either buying doing themselves or going through ad. They benefit both, right? If you look at, um, if you're doing it yourself, if you're less professional, so now it's an alternative, it's still gonna be cheap, but you're getting it professionally done versus if you go to a high, to ad firm, it will be very expensive, at least you're getting a decent logo so it's again a lot of benefit here a value provider offered a reminder service and links suggestions links or suggestions to get people to remember birthdays anniversaries uh, and, and other important dates basically value provider allowed people to quickly send flowers to a loved one recall important events and then send along a gift at the same time they target c-level types who might not have time to do all, all these things and also are too busy to recall. 
the issue was that these important people didn't actually do the buying or the remembering. It was the secretaries or personal assistants. So understanding who does the buying in the process is also a function of understanding the market. And this same example would hold true uh, to a lot of, for example, baby products. Um, if it's, it's, it's really the parents and other family members and friends who buy these things, not the babies. So make sure to get your target right. And then we talked about also customer economics previously. Um, Customer economics helps you provide uh, input as to whether the economics basics of what you do will actually work, right? And what I mean with this, you, you have to ask the questions, do the customers you, you identify actually have the money to buy from you, right? Are they economically able and willing to buy this? Will they spend it on you or are there any other pro priorities, even if they have money, right? And what are the next best alternatives or better choices to consider? You have to be aware of this and understand really what are the economics of your customers and how much are they willing and able to spend on, 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 on certain product service that you're also offering. And this also involves the importance of knowing your competitors and what value they create. Uh, here are a couple examples to help illustrate really what, what was learned about these two, these two companies. I'm sure most of you have kicked kids have heard of Leapfrog. Uh, Leapfrog is a famous educational toy manufacturer. Um, there are a lot of articles on, 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 on Leapfrog, such as the Fast Company article. Uh, there's, if you go to Fast Company or Google uh, Fast Company and Leap, you'll, you'll find an article called Leapfrog's Great Leap Forward. <coughs> Again, Leapfrog's Great Leap Forward. Uh, Mike Wood. The founder was trying to get little kids to read and by having fun as part of this process. So the original toy product allowed kids of, say, pronounced letter, not just to sound, but not just sound it made. So sort of saying A, you can say A is an apple. So that's an example. So Matt carried out a focus group with mothers to look at the feasibility of the product. He was lucky enough to get 20 mothers to participate, and all 20 absolutely loved the product. However, they also said that they wouldn't pay more than 50 bucks for such product. Only two would pay up to the uh, expected prices of approximately 100 given chips included in the product. So Matt, the owner, quickly realized that his target was correct, but his cost was too high. Uh, so the people, because the people with the pro problem couldn't afford the tender, the tender solution. And you'll see later when, when technology has changed, they were able to reduce the price, make it differently, and, and that's why LeapFrog was really successful. Bait was a started startup that went uh, that wanted to provide the luxury of the spa, but in comfort of your own home. Uh, it provided a me mechanism that you plugged into the shower head and would allow for essential oil and aroma to come out. It worked like glade plug in plugged in with the actual uh, contraption and having room for different scents and oils to be injected. So basically, uh, it made the shower at home a lot more luxurious. A price of 10 bucks for, for, for the attachment and then 5.75% per cent, percent, S C E N T. The target market was lower income single moms who might not afford to go to spa or have time off. Made sense from a first perspective, however, as bad the research, they realized that the money spent on the product was actually being spent elsewhere. The limited budget of these people had then prioritized other things and any money that may have been left over would be used at an actual spa to experience uh, because they were looking for experience and getting away from, from it all uh, was much more important than the money and so the 20 bucks spent on the home spa didn't actually solve the customer need but the research told them this if they haven't done research they would enter the market and would have lost a lot of money t targeting wrong customers and finally uh, one of the five points we had previously, um, it's the effectiveness of the idea. This helps you to really understand why customers might buy the products or services and why. So in this, when you do, when you, when you look at the effectiveness of the idea, you answer the questions of what specifically do they like about the offering, what other attributes are important to them, and what attributes are not important to them. Uh, all these questions, um, 
play an important role for you in terms of how you move forward and how do you define, improve, and change your product and how you make the product available to them. So let's look at a short video by Guy Kawasaki. It's been my experience with Revolutions that people who are not your customers are going to buy your product and use it in ways you didn't expect. And the bizarre thing is that many companies, when they have this happen, which is a good thing, they freak out. They say, well, we have to reposition our product so the right people buy our product, and we want them to use it in the way we intended. At the very basis, let me tell you something. Take the money. <laughs> Take the money. When you see people who are not your intended customers doing things with your, un doing things with your product in unintended ways, it's a good thing. They are perverting your product. And when you see people perverting your product, that's a good thing. Because people only pervert products they care about. There's only two sort of conditions. They either like your product and pervert it, or they ignore your product. Trust me, it's much better that they like your product and pervert it. Okay. Now, this leads to a crucial engineering algorithm. There are two ways to fix a product in an engineering sense. One is you go to all the people who are not buying it, and you ask them, why aren't you buying it? They're going to give you good reasons. In 1984, they told me, I'm not buying a Macintosh because you don't have one, two, three. I hope you remember what that is, some of you. It's a spreadsheet. You know, a spreadsheet is a thing with rolls and columns that adds up. We had no one, two, three, and we had no layer quality printer driver. So we go and we convince Lotus to make one, two, three. We go and write a layer quality printer driver. We go back to Fortune 500 companies. They still don't buy it because they had other reasons. Okay. So that's one theory. You go to people who aren't buying, you ask them why, you come back to the lab, you fix. The other theory is you go to the people who are buying, you ask them why they're buying, and you give them more reasons to buy. Trust me, do that. Do that. If people don't get it, ignore them. If people don't get it, ignore them. I like to say it's better to sell to a virgin than to an atheist. Because an atheist denies your religion. A virgin has not been screwed before, might try your religion. Okay? So, okay? <laughs> This isn't being taped, right? <laughs> so to, to the point is to learn about why people are using what you are using or what you're selling. And there might be always hidden gold in really trying to figure out all the specific attributes that people love and what really doesn't matter to them. I think it was a great video. And, and uh, now you might be asking yourself, OK, this is all good. We have to do all these things, but then how do we learn? How do you learn these things? How do we figure out all these things affecting us of the idea? Does my idea work? How does uh, how do I figure out if my customers have the money? How do I figure out the, the buyer behavior and so on? Well, you have to do your research. And today, uh, the goal is really to teach some tools of how to do conduct market research and analysis. So there are two types of research, secondary research and the primary research. The secondary research is really the already collected data, which is used for other purposes as well. Some of those examples are commercial, re commercial research, general media, trade publications, internet, you can Google many things, and also competitors' website. Now, this is information and data that's available to anybody. Uh, the primary research is really information that's collected by you, for you, bit specific, Specific, uh, specifically to your purpose and purpose of your company. And this can be done in interviews, focus groups, observations, surveys, which we will cover today in, in, in more depth and detail. So really, two ways to conduct research, and you have to do both of them, which is secondary research and primary research. The secondary research, you already have done a lot of the work in, in, in your industry analysis. And then primary research is really digging deeper in finding out what's going on, who are your customers, how do they buy, are they willing and able to buy, how many of them there, are, and it doesn't make sense for you. Some of the key trade-offs between secondary and primary research, the positives of secondary research is it is easy to find, it's low cost, it gives you broad perspective, and allows you to overcome some hard hurdles. On the other side, the negative, co negative um, trade-offs of the, of the secondary research, it's publicly available, so anybody can has access to it. Uh, it's really general in the nature. It may be dated. Uh, it's not always trustworthy or reliable. And a lot of times it's incomplete and not always to the point. On the other hand, the primary research, the positive, it's really current. It's timely. 
specific to your needs, gets you also foot in the door, and, and it's proprietary data. This is the data that only you have. The negative, it's difficult to conduct, it's time consuming, and oftentimes it's costly. Solving the tra trade-off involves using each of these to learn about different aspects of the plan and the customer. Not all, not every business has to do really the, the primary research, but I highly recommend that all you should do. Uh, and for broad questions such as how many people live in a certain area, how an industry is changing, changes in tastes, the average cost, cost of labor in the industry, and so on, please use secondary research data to the point generally publicly available. Uh, some of the best resources that are out there are in the Yahoo Industry Center. Uh, it provides you the directory of industries, com companies per industry, industry news, and much more. Quick facts, this is a census bureau data about spending, incomes, age, and other demographics. Uh, BizStats.com it provides you industry benchmarks and other financial help. Uh, don't forget the websites of your competitors and the places where the products and services are sold as well as talk to uh, to your retail to your to the association retail association association that are you in, in particular for industry other not free ones uh, university or public libraries will all, also oftentimes offer access to other sources that aren't normally free so make sure to go visit your local library or university library a lot of them have uh, free passes for non students uh, they have great resources, and most libraries do have a business librarian, so make sure to connect to a business librarian as well. Um, so some of the not-so-free resources that a lot of times are available at university and public libraries are the Business and Company Resource Center, which provides you trends and industry reports, the ProQuest, which uh, gives you search publications such as Wall Street Journal, New York Times, then you have the Mintel, and then LexisNexis. These are all available, and there's actually many, many more if you go to either a university or, or a public library. Uh, what should you know from the secondary research? About the industry, as we talked in the last session, this is just a quick overview for, your, for you. You should know the statistics about number and attributes of your competitors, you know, financials, strategic focus for differentiation, how many employees, sales, and so on. Also, you want to identify how many number and locations of suppliers are there how many supporting firms, also you want to find out size and growth rate of industries, key trends, changes, developments in industry. So overall, you want to show the competitive conditions, who is involved, and where things are going. Um, <clears throat> what you should know from your, your market uh, when you do your secondary research is really the specifics about population demographics, really entire market size. You can figure this out in doing secondary research geographical economical breakdown and some trends uh, specific about your target market you can find out how many of them there are by using for example the census data uh, why them right provide the numbers and the ability to pay so overall picture what is going on in your market right now so the hard stuff really when it comes to figuring out about your market is the in-depth uh, research the, the butterflies that are specific to you which is being done and conducted through primary research and there are four ways of how you can do primary research. The, the primary research is the most time consuming research that you need to do but at the same time it's, it's the most useful and appropriate for what you, you're trying to do. At the end of the day your entire business plan rests upon the shoulders of your primary research and in particular your ability to prove, prove there is a market for what you're trying to do. So the main focus will be of uh, really now talk about primary research and getting uh, at the things that you'll need to know. So there are four types of primary research which you'll now cover in more detail, which is the interview, which are the interviews, observation, focus groups, and surveys. The interviews, um, what is an interview? The interview is really a discussion with knowledge uh, people or individuals within the industry and potential customers. If the, they should focus, the focus should be on open-ended questions in order to learn about the needs of people and discover unknown things in that when you talk to them. Uh, who should you interview? Should interview inter industry experts, people from trade associations, potential suppliers, expert and regular customers. Uh, you should really look for diversity here, not only people from your key target market. 
rule of thumb is at least five people, so at least five people with a few from each category with whom many more depending on your goal. When you should do this, this should be the first thing to do, looking at your overall feasibility of the idea and get into the details and counting numbers later. So the interviews are the first thing you should do. You should talk to all these individuals, experts, to find out really is their need, how big is the need, you can get some feedback about your products and services, as well as some suggestions how you can move forward. Some interview tips. When you go to an interview, please make sure to come prepared and get an interview guide ready. Use broad questions first to get them all talk from their own perspective from the customers. To get the perspective from the customers, such as an example would be, example questions would be like, tell me about the jeans that you're wearing. You know, can you tell me about the first pair of jeans that you really loved? What are the things that you love and hate about your wallet? What is your typical day like between meal times? What types of things do you look for and then whatever you want to ask for? Tell me about the challenges faced when, you know, ordering cable TV, for example. So when looking for people, use the phone or face-to-face. -face. Uh, random emails from strangers typically goes into the garbage. Uh, find someone from trade associations. Their job is to help people in that industry and help that industry overall. And here is a, uh, uh, here is a link to IDII.com Resources Association. Uh, so these types of questions can change sub 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 substantially depending on the topic, but as preliminary step and example, these help to provide a few examples of what might or what, what, what might or what might not work for you when you do your interviews. Observations are another tool for pri for primary research. Uh, observation is really, as the name already says, it's you observing, you're watching how people use your product or services, and you understand the benefits of this and look for alternative uses. Who should you observe? You should observe customers, preferably your target customers. And when you should do this as a part of coming up with idea or as part of early stages of existing product. Obviously, varying useful, useful, usefulness depends on your concept that you have. And here's a great example, a great video by Tom Kelly, the general manager of IDEO, who talks about the usage of the observations and how effective observations have been for them. About 10 years ago, we got approached by one of the largest uh, oral health care companies in America, a company you've probably heard of called Oral-B, and they said, look, we'd like a new kid's toothbrush because ours is starting to get commoditized. It looks like a lot of kid's toothbrushes out there, and you can't have that. We want to be special, right? So we say, okay, we'll do this. We want to go out in the field and do some field research. And they're kind of not sure about that. Like, it's not rocket science. We're talking about kids brushing their teeth. How hard could that be, right? They would really like us to stop fooling around and start designing, right? But we want to go through this process, this observation process, because we think almost always you can spot opportunities. And so we go out, and we're on like the first day of observations, and we make a small discovery. The small discovery we make is that Every kid's toothbrush in the history of the world has had the same implicit assumption. It's a logical assumption, it just isn't exactly right. Which is, the assumption always was, parents have big hands, kids have small hands, and so when you want to make the kid's version, make it like the parent's brush, only smaller and skinnier. Perfectly logical, until you go out in the field until you actually watch humans, little tiny humans, brushing their teeth. And what you notice right away, you get a five-year-old boy brushing his teeth, he's not holding his toothbrush in his fingertips the way mom and dad do, he's fisting it. He's holding it like this because he doesn't have the dexterity, he doesn't have the fine motor controls that his parents have, and so he's gotta hold it like this. In fact, the other thing he does is, he holds the brush too far up very frequently, and so he's punching himself in the face as he's trying to brush his teeth, and we solved that problem too. But the main thing was, came back in the field and said, uh-oh, kids don't need little skinny toothbrushes. Kids need big, fat toothbrushes, right? Let's make them big, fat, squishy toothbrushes. And you may have noticed, now every toothbrush company in the world makes these, but our, our client reports that after we made that little, tiny discovery, out in the field, sitting in a bathroom watching a five-year-old boy brush his teeth, they had the best-selling kid's toothbrush in the world for 18 months. 
So when you think about power, when you think about you know, credibility, if you could go out in the field and do that observation and come up with that finding, and your company, your organization was the best in its field for 18 months afterwards, would that be worth it? I think that would be worth it. And so that's this message about think like a traveler, be an anthropologist, use your powers of observation, have that part of your brain turned up as high as you can uh, all, all along. So I hope the video by Tom Kelly was really helpful in, in, in explaining to you the importance of observations. Another tool is the focus group. Focus groups, this is a discussion with small groups of individuals, with target customers really, anywhere between 5 and 10. Uh, here just as an interview when I ask open-ended questions, allow people to complain, uh, see if others agree about those complaints, hear any inputs, feedback. Let people build off of each other and share thoughts. Uh, you should really only include the target customers and this should be conducted when the concept is settled it, because it gives you feedback on what you have and it's only a starting point. And, and final tool is the survey. Uh, surveys is a list of specific and focused questions. It gives you larger numbers in terms of respondents and can get help provide insights into the wider market. Uh, you should survey from larger sample of potential customers. The rule of thumb is usually 100 people for a survey. Uh, it, it can be done online, in person, by phone and mail. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, in person is best, followed by phone, mail and online. Effect on cost and time is opposite, right? It takes you longer to do in person and then online is the easiest one. Uh, the surveys can be done and should be done at different stages of the planning process. Definitely also once you have concepts settled. Uh, in terms of surveys, it is important that you develop a great survey, an effective survey to get the information you're looking for. Unlike in an interview, an interview you can ask follow-up questions. In the survey you only have a set of questions. So if you miss some questions, you're going to miss a lot of relevant data that, that's, that might be effective or that might affect your decision making. So include definitely some demographic questions which will help, help you ensure that you have the right or the correct target market. I highly recommend that you put demographic questions at the end because a lot of times you put in the beginning, if I answer I'm a student, my mindset is going to be like, okay, I have to answer all these questions as a student, not, not as me, but as a student, and what is expected for a student to answer. So I highly recommend putting demographics questions at the end. Uh, there are cheap tools to do this. You can use SurveyMonkey. There are up to a certain number of questions. You can get it for free, but also some of them are about 20, 20 bucks a month for limited questions. Do not use yes or no questions. Most decisions are not so black and white. Include things on a 1 to 5 scale, such as an example of how satisfied are you with your cable provider. Not satisfied at all would be number 1, and extremely satisfied would be number 5. Um, some more survey tips. Uh, don't forget to ask about attributes and benefits of your, right? specifically attributes of your product. Such an example would be how important are the following criteria uh, for satisfaction for a cable provider, right? So you can identify these criteria. Uh, these two parts are really important as they can help show you some of the key nuggets of info that you are looking for. I always include two questions as they really are telling about what people like and whether they're willing, whether they're willing to pay. In terms of discounting part, think about not getting too over positive with the results. What people say not always what they do, and survey results may not present true tastes. Thinking of description of, of the product as old school sauce with homemade taste. However, uh, how informative and true, how informative and true is this really? So the, the, the Nestle method used discount the intent to purchase question is 80% of definitely, 30% of probably, and 0% of other in terms of really predicting what customers are going to do. So just quickly one more time that uh, let's say if you are asking questions that include price ranges and you want to use this definitely as a separate question, you know, you want to use the same scaling, definitely, probably, might or might not, probably not, and definitely not. If you ask the question, are you willing to pay between, you know, five and nine dollars and um you know, select 5 to 9, 10 to 15, 20 to 50, 55, whatever, and then people select, um, let's say, 10 to 15. So you rather want to ch charge 
you want to charge 15 and then 10 you know they're willing and able to pay that price range and you want to find out how many of them are there that are willing and able to pay that and use, use for this the same thing if if 100 people say they're willing and able to pay between 10 and 15 dollars then the rule of thumb says or the, the nestle method says 80 out of the 100 are willing to pay that much if 100 say definitely then only 30 out of the 100 are willing to pay between 10 and 15 so depending on how many people you got in those different scales you know once you discount it you can really see your, your cost benefit is it really better to charge you know nine dollars or is it better to charge 15 and uh, depending on the, on, on the people that responded to you so that was a quick summary of the four tools that we use in um, primary research the caveat here is that you are never going to know everything uh, most of the information is not out there so really you have to do there is a need to do uh, primary research and the longer it takes to do the more things change so it's really important that you do it the timing is very important uh, but the butterflies that you might have when you start this process should disappear and if nothing else remember that the research that you have done the whole process will help you with your knowledge, it will build your confidence, it will produce contacts, open doors with you, and uh, so the relationship with your customers. So it will open doors to your customers, and that goes a long way. At least people will know a lot about you, and let's say if it doesn't work, you know, the if next time you come around with a new product, you can leverage a lot of these relationships you already have create, created or built, or you might even identify something new or additional while conducting the, the, the the surveys, conducting interviews and focus groups and so on. To summarize, a lot of times we get a question, so when do I, what kind of research do I do for what questions? So I, I want to finish the, uh, the session with just a summary of the types of questions and then what types of research do you use, to, do you conduct to answer those questions. So when it comes to asking the questions of how many customers are there, you know, this is easily to get to a secondary research what are the key trends in industry we have done this in the last week really this is secondary research uh, what do the comp competitors do uh, secondary research you can visit their websites but also you can interview both the competitors but also their cu customers or the suppliers to find out what they're doing how they do it and everything else that you are very interested in, in finding out when you ask a question do the customers know they have a problem? This you will do in a survey, in an interview, in a focus group. Uh, when we talk about attributes, what attributes do customers like best? You want to do your focus group and a survey. Remember survey, you want to do those scaling questions and, and keep it sometimes uh, keep it more open as much as you can to find out as many information as you can. Do not do yes or no or black or white. It's not that easy. You'll, you'll be missing a lot of information that's relevant to decision making and will the customers pay uh, this is done in an interview as well as in survey and we talked about this quickly when we talked about some of the survey trips, the tips so really the to summarize the research is key for a business plan and informative about the feasibility of your company types of research questions lead to different types of research methods and if you do them all well um, you should be able to do to understand really your customers behavior when they buy how they buy and you will have a strong foundation that will enable you to develop a great marketing plan strategic plan in terms of how to access how to tap into those customers how to maintain the relationship with them and how to build the relationships and grow them but it will also help you understand what you need to have in place in order to reach the customer which we will talk later on in, in different sessions Thank you and we look forward to answer your questions or any, address any concerns if you have them during office live hours. Keep entrepreneuring.